format for this meeting is a film speaker meeting for the prison TV to carry the message of hope and recovery to incarcerated prisoners throughout the country. Tonight, please help me welcome Trevor as your guest speaker. What's up, fellas? My name is Trevor Chaka, and I am a crystal meth addict. Trevor. And a trash can dumpster, would you say, Matthew? Trash can addict. Definitely not a Mexican American. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm Italian. I was trying to figure out a play on that. But, anyways, uh, so like I said, Trevor Chaka. Uh, I am a cross addicted drug addict, alcoholic. Uh, I am a human dumpster. I will stuff anything in my face and in my body and in my veins. Uh, that will produce an effect that uh, is, is good for me. Um, I absolutely cannot stand being sober when I am not living in a spiritual, spiritually fit condition. Um, I have an immense amount of anxiety and uh, lack of confidence and uh, just discomfort. The book talks about being irritable, restless, and discontent. And um, I need to produce a, an effect to make that go away. So, hence the human dumpster, right? Uh, 829 of 2012 is when I got sober. I shot my last rig of dope on 828 of 2012. Uh, Gary Waugh is my sponsor. Wizard of Nods is my home group. Uh, my service commitment, I've got several. I am the advisor for the 2000, uh, 2020 Heroin Anonymous convention that's going to be coming up the summer of next year. Um, sponsor several dudes. And uh, I introduce myself like that because those are the requirements that have been asked of me. Uh, to stay in the middle of the mix and stay sober, you know. Um, man, I was driving over here tonight, and uh, every time I, I, I move down the road and I'm asked to show up and be of service, man, um, I feel like it's my responsibility to be here, right? I've been given a huge, huge, huge gift had a spiritual awakening and every single morning when I wake up the monkey to get loaded is no longer on my back and so when Jay asked me to come and speak quite a while back I put it in my calendar and I will do everything in my power to be here tonight and as I'm driving across the freeway and I'm driving across in my truck my my not driving dirty anymore you know I got I got a licensed man again and I got I got insurance and the truck I'm driving I own <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't boost it from anybody or steal my mom's car you know I'm driving down the road perfectly legal and of course now that I'm perfectly legal like the cops never mess with me man and I never get any trouble I never get pulled over you know it's a very very rare occasion if I'm you know if I'm ever in contact with the police anymore and, and as I'm driving down the road man I, I turn the radio off and uh, I start doing a little like in motion meditation and in motion prayer, you know, and, and I start to try to really get focused on how grateful I am to be able to show up and come talk to a bunch of dudes that I don't know, but I absolutely know. Like, I don't know you guys, but I know you guys. And I know why you're here, right? And, yeah. and you're like brothers to me, and I've never shook in your hands. You know what I mean? And I'm driving down the road, and I, I'm getting this internal experience in, 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 a, in a, I'm flashing back to when I was one month and two months sober, fresh out of jail and, and sitting in a little halfway house down the armpit of Phoenix and uh, not knowing the direction that my life was about to take. Having no idea, man, just sitting in a huge, huge upheaval of, uh, of negative emotion, man, and fear and uh, Hadn't talked to my family for quite a long time, man, and, and it's, you know, September now, and of course, man, now I'm sober, man, and I'm, you know, just not feeling well, man, because the early days of, uh, the, the early, early days of sobriety are painful, man, and I don't know if you guys can identify with that, but just getting sober, dude, it's like, you know, cool, man, like, I, I found my way to Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and, and you handed me this big book, and you said, okay, we're going to start doing some steps, and you got to get a service commitment, but the thing that, the thing that made me right, you, like, ultimately took away. You know, like the dope and the booze is now gone. And now I'm really, really miserable and in pain, you know? And so I'm just flashing back as I'm driving down the road and I'm thinking about coming out here and talking to you guys. And I'm like, yeah, man, I remember September, man. And I remember October and I, I kind of remember November, man. And I guess what I'm trying to say, guys, is that this is, you guys are, this is like, 
this is like the best time of year to get sober. <laughs> it really is, man. Now, like, there's some, there's some, there's some, there's some counter thoughts that are, that, that, that could go to that, or some counter arguments that could go to that. Like, you know, like if you're in Phoenix, Arizona, and you're getting sober, like the time to get sober is like June, so that you can get out of the heat and like into the air conditioning. You know, like that makes sense to me. But, but what I'm talking about, man, is like the holidays are coming up, dude. You know, and, and I don't know about you guys, man, but like I hadn't talked to my family for like a really, really, really long time, you know, and uh, and all of a sudden I'm out of jail, man, and I hadn't talked to them for a really long time, and and uh, I'm starting to do the steps, and things are starting to change a little bit, and, and, and October's rolling around, and November's rolling around, and I'm making contact with my mom for the first time, and uh, I'm making phone calls out of the little halfway house, and uh, and I finally get a phone call through, you know, and, and, and I guess what's cool, man, is that, that you guys are about to embark on a journey, man, that's gonna blow your flipping minds. It's gonna blow your flipping minds, man. And I know that that doesn't resonate with a lot of you right now. I know that you can't connect with what I'm saying, but I'm here to tell you, dude, that you guys are looking at a dope fiend and a drug addict that was blown out to the max, completely disowned by his family, hadn't had contact with my little boy for several years, completely destroyed every opportunity that I had, felony cases pending again, nothing but wreckage and damage and trouble, and here I am, freshly sober, ending up in a, in a, in a halfway house, out of jail, and nothing's looking really bright for me, man. And I guess what I'm trying to say to you guys right now, man, is that, <clears throat> is that there are some of you that are in here that are getting ready to like get onto a journey, like it's, it's, it's indescribable. I can't, even, I can't even fully articulate. I'll share with you guys tonight a little bit about my story and how I got there, but I, I cannot even get, I can't even put into words how awesome things are about to get for you guys, you know? How many guys in here haven't talked to their family in quite some time? Yeah. How many family, how many guys in here have got little kids that hey, they haven't seen in, in, in a while? Yeah, man. I'm gonna tell you guys, I got a little soft since I sober so if you see my eye water up man just, let, just letting you know dude um, man that, that, that shit hurts you know when you ain't seen your kid for a minute man you know or, or, or your mom's sick or maybe she just passed away you know like my mom's got cancer right now right and I hadn't seen my little boy for for quite a few years man and that shit would just stuff would just eat my soul, would just chew me up, you know? And he'd get me into the beginning days of recovery, man, and you got all that weight on your shoulder, and you're sitting in the Salvation Army, or you're sitting in county jail, or you're sitting in prison, man, and you're just sitting there, and it's just chewing on you, and chewing on you, and chewing on you, you know? Some of you guys are gonna to get to talk to your family. Some of you guys don't have families right now. When the holidays move in, the coolest thing is gonna happen, man. This is what's gonna happen. You're gonna start realizing and seeing the new family that God is gonna start developing around you. You're gonna start going to your friend's house. I don't know how many guys that I know that, that were locked up in jail, locked up in prison, locked up here, in, here at the Salvation Army that are sitting there that I've heard the story over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah, man, we were back, we were in the Salvation Army, me and him, back in 2012 or 2014. These dudes are started new families, got their own businesses going, working for good companies, got full benefits. Same story. <coughs> got their feet set in, 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 in the Salvation Army, started doing the work, started getting close to God, started developing a relationship with God here, started getting those seeds planted, and got busy in Alcoholics Anonymous or Crystal Meth Anonymous or Heroin Anonymous or Cocaine Anonymous and start doing the 12 steps, and their lives have changed. These dudes are fully functional, including me, out there in the real world right now, right? And the reason I'm pounding on this so hard, guys, the reason that I'm just driving this stuff home and trying to evoke some emotion in you guys right now is you guys are sitting in a position to be catapulted or rocketed into what we call the fourth dimension, right? Like, your life is going to take on a whole new meaning. So, I'll get on with it. Uh, my name is Trevor Chaka. I'm a heroin addict. I'm a crystal meth addict. Uh, I was born and raised right here in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so I'm very, very familiar with, with this area. 
I know I, I, I know the I know the terms, man. I ran around out in, in East Mesa for quite a while. I know what the square is, man. I know I know I know where Sunny Slope is, man. I like I, I, I know where to get down. I know how to get down anywhere in the valley. So it doesn't even matter if I have a car or not, you know, like I know where to go, you know, as far as getting high is concerned. And uh yeah, man, <clears throat> uh I don't know, man. I remember um I remember being a little kid, man, and I think as early, well, whatever age it is that you come into like full consciousness. I don't even know if that's different for everybody, but I'm talking about where you start having like legitimate memories of, of, of life, right? And I remember, uh, I remember uh, being a pretty free kid, meaning internally speaking. <clears throat> I was with my parents at the time that were married. <clears throat> very, very, very dysfunctional household. Uh, my mother is uh, is a is an alcoholic uh, drug addict, right? That uh, that's been in and out of hospitals and institutions the majority of my life. Um, went through a fierce, fierce phase in the '80s uh, with crack cocaine. Um, found Jesus for a while, man. Uh, got heavily involved in the church. Relapsed. I mean, there was a lot of commotion going on there at, at an early age. Uh, uh, my dad uh, would be what you would classify as a, as a hard drinker, talks about in the big book. You know, the hard drinker, he's the kind of guy that can drink, 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 pound, 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 pound. Uh, doesn't do drugs, drinks real heavily. But when consequences start to add up onto him, uh, he has the ability, some strange ability, unlike me, to be able to be like, okay, that's it, I'm done. Like, I'm going to put it down, right? Like, the doctor says my one kidney that I have right now, because he's only got one kidney, is suffering immensely from the, from the drinking that I'm doing. And so I need to shut it down for a while. And he has the ability to just shut it down, right? And my mom on the other side of the spectrum or or a little further down the, the road is, is is the real alcoholic. She's the kind of gal that's that, that you know she picks up a drink man and, 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 and it's and it's game on, right? I mean it's it's we're jumping on the train man and the train ain't stopping. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? I'm the same way. And so so I remember being a little kid and coming up in a in, in this household of commotion, man, a lot of aggression. Dad's dad's a hothead, there's a lot of fighting going on and, and, and physical craziness going on, whatever is what it is. And uh, and so I just remember a lot of commotion going on, but I, at the same time I remember like in the midst of the the, the, the insanity of the world, man, and all the madness that was kind of going around, uh, going on around me, man. I remember being able to, like, walk outside and, like, smell the air, you know? And I remember being able to walk outside and being fascinated by the, the birds and the trees, you know? And I remember walking outside and I would go out barefooted, man, and my dad had one of those sprinklers back in the day. It was one of those, you know, those ones, you know, it was like a park sprinkler. He was, you know, we didn't have, like, the in-ground sprinklers, you know? He, like, stuck a post in the ground, tried not to trip over the hose, you know, and I'd go outside and, and I'd play out in the sprinklers and, and uh, you know, man, and, and life was pretty cool, man. And I remember, I remember uh, my favorite day of the week, dude, it was a Tuesday. And uh, don't ask me, it was like a Tuesday or Thursday. Don't ask me how I remember that, but I remember it was pretty, it was a pretty important day for me. And in the midst of all the commotion and all the chaos, the big day was, was, was Tuesday or Thursday. It was, it was garbage day. <laughs> and, uh, Back in the 80s, man, <clears throat> we didn't have the cool dumpsters that you roll out to the street with the big wheels. Now we had the metal cans that you stuck out on the street. And the garbage dudes would drive down the road, and they would have one dude that would drive the truck, and then the other dude that would hang off the back. You guys remember that? Any of you guys remember that? And so the dude would jump off the back. Anyways, absolutely love these guys. And, uh, and I remember they were like, they were like in, the, in the midst of all the chaos, man. Like these dudes were my heroes. Like they were my absolute heroes, man. And I remember I would sit there and it'd be like seven o'clock in the morning. And I would, I would, I would hear that, that dumpster truck coming on the cul-de-sac on the back side of the street. And I knew they were coming, man. So I would run out the back door. I'd unlatch the back door. My parents would try to trick me and stick a stick in the thing. And so I'd flip that stick across. I'd slide that door open. I'd run out, run around the backyard, run to the back gate. Jump up and down, jump up and down, catch the little rope, open the gate, run out to the front of the street, and I just sit there, wait for the garbage dudes to come, you know. And here they would come, man. They'd come around a corner, and as soon as they would come around the corner, I would start jumping up and down, doing this. Mm, 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 mm. And uh, and of course, man, they knew I was going to be standing there waiting for them, you know. And uh, and so they'd, they'd be standing there with a white T-shirt. Yeah, what's up, dude? You know. And they'd come around the corner, and, and sure enough, man, they'd get on the the diesel horn, you know. Oh, oh, oh. They start honking the horn. I'd start jumping up and down. Yeah, dude, this is this is it, man. This is it. I'm trying not to cuss. And uh, so, anyways, uh, you know, they they'd come around the corner and, and they'd come down, man, and they'd uh, they they'd get off the truck, you know, and 
And I remember just being in love with these dudes, you know, like, I didn't even know them, man, but I was so connected to them. They were just like so cool to me, man, you know, and, and, uh, and they, they come out, they, what's up, little man? They give me high fives. I'd be trying to drag the garbage can over the backside of the truck, you know, and, you know, and they'd help me and we'd throw the dump, you know, throw the garbage in the thing. And I remember it was like, so funny, man. Like, <clears throat> like I remember, uh, we had uh, kindergarten career day. Some of you guys might not remember that. Some of you guys might do, right? So you go to kindergarten, you dress up as what you want to be when you're older, right? <clears throat> and, uh, and you know, so you got like, you got like, you got like Sally, like she wants to be like a figure skater, right? Because, you know, whoever, you know, she wants to be a figure skater, that's cool, right? And then you got like Johnny, he wants to be like a DEA agent because his uncle's a cop or something, right? So he's dressed up as a cop, you know? And uh, you, whatever, so you got everybody. So I show up to, I show up to school, man, and I got, I got, I got a pair of Oshkosh Bagosh suspenders on. I got a white t-shirt on. I got a construction hat on, which doesn't make a lot of sense. And I've got uh, rubber ducky, or the ducky yellow rubber boots on, pretending that they're gonna be work boots, you know? And uh, so anyways, uh, so they were like, Trevor, what do you wanna be when you grow up? <laughs> And I looked at him and I was like, I want to be a black garbage man. And the whole <laughs> class started laughing, you know? And I was being dead serious, man. You know, I was being dead serious. Like, they were my heroes, you know? They were absolutely my heroes. And, uh, and everybody started laughing at me. I was like, why are they laughing at me? You know, like, I really wanted to be a black garbage man when I got older. My mom still tells that story every once in a while. And, uh, and, and, and some people, when I'm telling that story, are like, where's this dude going with all this? You know, like... Where is this guy? Who, where, he wants to be a black garbage man when you get older. This is an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Well, the reality of it is for me, guys, is that when we talk about the second step and come, come to believe in a power greater ourselves could restore us to sanity, in the second step, there's an implication, man, that at some point in time I was sane. And most people can't remember that time. And there was another speaker that I heard somewhere around 18 months sober, somewhere around my second year, and he talked about that time in his life. Right? And when I, when I go in reverse, man, like, that was a time that uh, the chaos of the world is never going to stop. What's going on out there right now is never going to stop. The insanity and the sickness and the drugs and all the, 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 the just craziness that's going on out there is never going to stop. Right? And here I am in the middle of the most chaotic time of my life, right? A lot of really crazy stuff going down inside of my house. But I'm like free inside for some weird reason. Like I'm present to the moment, right? And when I'm talking about the second step, man, it's like that's the point in which I want to go back to, right? I want to get back to that time in my life where I was free no matter what was going on. I want to be restored to sanity, you see? And, and what's happened, man, is that as I've moved along in my journey, man, as I, as I started taking suggestions and as I started listening and doing things contrary to what my mind was telling me, the closer I've come back to being that young, innocent kid that loved everybody, that didn't know what a garbage guy was, it didn't know that this was a black dude or a white dude or a Mexican dude or like had no idea that there was any difference, you know what I mean? There was no ugliness. The world hadn't really gotten a hold of me. You know what I mean? It was just love, man. It was just love, you know? And so anyways, uh, so yeah, so let's fast forward. I remember, uh, I remember going through the chaos and I remember at some point in time, I don't know if it was around like 10 or 11, age doesn't really matter, but it was relatively, I was relatively young and I remember just having kind of a nervous quirk to me. And I don't know if it was because of what was going on out there. I don't know if it's genetics. I don't even try to enter that discussion, man. You'll hear a lot of people having those big, long-winded conversations. I'm not particularly interested. I'm, uh, I've gotten pretty good and learned how to, to spend my energy wisely, I guess I would say. But I do remember being young, man, in, in, in growing up into to getting into grade school, man. And I remember being... Uh, <sighs> I remember just starting to get this, this weird hole inside my chest, man, you know, where I started to get anxious, man, and I started to get kind of socially awkward, man, and I didn't really feel right. And what ended up happening as a result of that, man, was some defects of character, as we, as we call them, or some, some shortcomings, man, started to, started to really creep out. And what that kind of looked like for me, man, was 
I was kind of a hyper aggressive kid. So I was kind of the kid that would, would, would get picked on a little bit, picked on a little bit, picked on a little bit, and then have these massive, massive explosions into, into full blown aggression and, and violence, right? And, uh, and what that looked like for me, man, was trouble with the cops as I got older. Uh, you guys know the drill. You guys know the story, right? There's, there was some stuff that, that went down there that, man, that wasn't good, right? And, uh, and I remember just being awkward, man, and, and not feeling right, man. And I, I always tell my guys, man, I tried to keep it real, real simple for them. It was like, it was like I always felt like the dude that, that you know, like I wear a size 13 shoe, man, and I, I, I felt like I was the dude that walked around with a size 13 on my left foot and a size 10 on my right foot, right? Or some guys say, you know, like you feel like you have a rock in your foot. Like I always feel internally insecure or awkward. And that, that is a, a bad platform to live your life off of, you know? Incredibly uncomfortable, incredibly awkward, man, and, 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 and it got a lot of weird stuff going on internally. You guys identify with that? You guys feeling that? Like I just, the book talks about it. Irritable, restless, discontent. Irritable, restless, discontent. I don't feel right inside. There is a problem internally. And I need to find a, I need to find a solution to fix it. And it's buried so deep in me, man, and it never goes away. Like, I don't feel right inside. So my sister was older. I have an older sister. I have three younger brothers. And uh, real pretty girl. Blonde head, pretty girl. And uh, she had real pretty friends. And, uh, and I remember one night, they were like two years older than me, and I remember one night she invited me. I came up, I grew up in the Alhambra School District. So I went to uh, Barcelona Elementary and uh, the, the, the yeah, it's irrelevant. Anyways, we went to one of the we went to one of the elementary schools, and uh, she invited me to go hang out with them one night. And uh, I remember I was like I was really nervous about it, but I was like, yeah, I want to go really bad because April's hot, you know. Like her friend is so good looking, you know. And uh, so I remember uh, she invited me out, and we went out there, and, and, and I knew that they kind of like did wild stuff, you know. And so I wanted to go hang out. So I was like the little brother, kind of tagging along, you know. And uh, but I remember having like almost a panic attack, like a nervous, anxious, like a panic attack, making myself go, you know? And, and so I got there and uh, we're hanging out and it's dark out and it's back in, like I said, it's back in the eighties, you know, and the, when the, when the, when the, there's the big backstops for the baseball fields, the chain link backstops. And then they had the, you know, the lights that would, the, the yellowish orangish lights that would kind of light up the field, you know, and, and, and we're out there and, and they're smoking camel cigarettes. Yeah. You know, they're passing camel cigarettes around and, uh, and I'm feeling cool, man, you know, and, and, uh, and then all of a sudden they break out a bottle of this stuff. It was like peach, like mad dog 2020 or something. It was just it tasted nasty, man, you know? And then like, then they broke out a bottle of this wild turkey. You know, I started passing that around and everybody's passing it around and taking swigs off of it. And, and I remember it going around and I remember kind of catching a little buzz off the cigarette. And, you know, I got, I, like I said, I must have been, I don't know, like 11, 12 maybe. And I, and I remember catching a little buzz off the cigarette and I'm like, yeah, you know, and I'm like, I'm all nervous, you know, and there's like older dudes there, older boys, you know, and I'm like feeling kind of nervous and I'm with all these older people and, and oh my God, she's so hot, you know, and and uh, and and all of a sudden that mad dog, that MD twenty twenty comes around to me, man, and I was like, I was like, I don't know about this, but I was like, I didn't want to look stupid, you know, and so I took that MD twenty twenty and I took it, started drinking, you know, started drinking. And I take one more, take one more, and I took another drink, and I remember it, and, and I passed it off, and then I went and started going back around the circle again, and I'm sitting there, and within I don't know if. If my, my, my memory serves me correctly, it was within two or three minutes, and I caught my first buzz, like real buzz ever. And it was like, oh, you know, it was like, it was like, it was like the clouds separated, and God came riding out of the sky on a horse, dude, a big white horse, you know, and he's like, come here, son, let me show you some stuff, you know, and, and, uh, and, 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 and what I noticed, man, immediately was like, all that anxiety, man, and all that panic, and all that awkwardness, and all of that weirdness internally inside me, man, like, went right out the window. It was gone. 
And all of a sudden, my shoulders got back a little bit, and I was looking at the older dudes. I was like, what's up, bro? <laughs> what you looking at, man? You know? And I look over at April. I'm like, what's up, April? How you doing tonight? You know? <laughs> like, all of a sudden, I grew a set. You know what I mean? Like, like instantly, you know, within three minutes, you know? And, uh, and I remembered it. It just went, it went, it went like alcoholic out the gate. Now, like, give me the bottle. Give me the bottle. Give me, I'm 12 years old. Let me, let me hit that wild turkey. Let me smoke another cigarette. You know, like, I'm climbing up the backstop and everybody's yelling at my sister, like, get your brother down. He's losing his mind. You know, and like, I'm, I'm like yelling and cussing at the neighbors, you know, and like, I'm just like, all of a sudden, like, man, like the real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, like, all of a sudden, like, seems like a pretty decent dude. And it talks about it in the book. Seems like a pretty decent dude, but let him drink for a day. And all of a sudden, he's like, dangerously antisocial. You know, like, that's me, man. And that's always been me, you know? Like, something weird happens to me, you know? And I know you guys probably can't, well, maybe you can't can kind of see that there's something not right here, but you know, like, like, like all of a sudden, I guess I should get back to the point, man, was like, all of a sudden, dude, like I had my first drink in me, man, and all of a sudden I felt like, okay, you know? And I remember clear as day. I remember clear as day that night, and I've had this experience twice. I said to myself, if I could feel like this for the rest of my life, everything would be all right, you know? If I can feel like this, if I can feel okay, everything will be all right. Can you guys get down with that? You guys know what I'm talking about? Where all that crap inside just goes out the window? All of a sudden, you found the solution to the problem, right? Now I feel all right, man. Hey, what's up, bro? How you doing? What's going on, man? Hey, what do you want to do tonight? Hey, now we can go hang out. Now we can do stuff. Now we can go to the club. Now we can hang out at the bar, you know? And like this, this, this behavior of mine started at a really, really early age, man, and I learned quick, quickly as an alcoholic how to fix what was going on inside here fast, you know? And I remember, I could tell you guys stories all night long. I'm an army vet. I remember going overseas. I remember being overseas. And I remember we would go through, we would do our training, we would go fly around in helicopters, get the big ego check, shoot big machine guns out of the side of the out of the out of the side of the bird, you know, go to the range, be in graphic gear, doing whatever, shooting, shooting stuff up, blowing stuff up, having a good time. And then and then and then I remember at the end of the night, man, I would get back to the barracks or wherever we were at, if we were on FTX, RTEP, whatever. We'd come back and I remember sitting there and I remember being like, all the dudes were like, hey man, they just built the new gazebo down here between the barracks, let's go hang out, man, let's have a barbecue. And I remember inside, man, not being right. And I remember inside having, I would have, had gone to the PX earlier in the evening and I remember sitting there and stashing a 12 pack of Budweiser in my little refrigerator that I had in my room. And I remember I have to drink like two or three beers just to kind of get primed to go out and socialize, you know? Like I just needed something in me, man, to like, be okay just to get out, you know? You guys get you guys get down with that? You know what I'm talking about? And so anyways, man, <clears throat> looking back, man, like, like, I can articulate that experience really, really well now or pretty decent because of the experiences that I've had to date inside sobriety, right? Like, I don't know how many times I've read through this book because my sponsor asked me to read through it. More so how many times I've read through this book because I've been taking guys through the steps. And every time I read through it, I get a little deeper understanding. And every time I read through it, I get a little better, clearer understanding of my own experience in the past and present, you know what I mean? And so I remember it's the same thing, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll fast forward, man, and, it, it, you know, I got out of the military, you know, man, and it turned into, it turned into a, a heavy meth addiction, heavy heroin addiction. I remember going through all kinds of crazy experiences where I was like, dude, you need to step up to the plate. I remember my grandfather, man, he was a, a World War II Marine, and I remember him coming over to me one night, man, and he brought me, he wrote me a letter in, 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 when I was in the middle of the chaos, just in the, it just, just completely imploding and falling apart, man, and just lost my job and my fiance's pregnant. And I remember coming, him over, coming over, it was, it was shortly before he died, and he said, son, you need to step up to the plate you need to lace your boots up because I know you're a tough SOB and you need to get it together and get on the right path. You got a little boy coming. You got some things you got to get handled. You just lost your job. You need to find a new job. 
you need to read this letter. And I went through and I read the letter and he, and, and I, and he told me to call him after I read the letter. <clears throat> and it was a heartfelt letter. I love you so much. You're a good kid. I always knew that you had a little wild side to you. You know, if I was your age and the things that were available to, would have been available to me, I can't honestly say what I, if I would have done them or not, you know? And uh, he's, a, he, at this point in time, he's a, He's a retired cop, man, just just hard as nails, you know, and, and, and just a hard old old gangster, you know. And uh, he comes in, 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 so I call him up, and I remember calling him up, and I remember being like, Grandpa, you know what, you're right. You're right. Like, for him to write that letter to me, like, shooting warning shots at me, I was like, you're absolutely right, you know, like, like I totally get it. You know, like, you're, you're so right. And I felt this, like, internal willpower of just pure just awesomeness like this is it it's getting done right and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna turn it around right now you know you guys ever experienced that where it's like okay dude i gotta step up to the plate dude i gotta be a man i gotta show up for my family my parents are getting older my mom's sick whatever the reason is man like you have like a legitimate reason behind what you're doing to change course right and i'm sitting there and i have a conversation with him he comes back over you know, we cry a little bit. And he said, I love you so much, so I'm so proud of you. You're going to step up and get this done. You're right. And, and every single thing inside of me was telling 110% of the truth. I'm done. It's over. I hear you. I'm reading you five by five. Check. Roger that. Out. <laughs> that night, I got a needle in my arm. Sir. Yeah. That night, I got a needle in my arm. I just got the chills, man. Same thing, sitting in county jail. This is it. I'm done. It's over. I'm going to hit a yard. Don't want to hit the yard. Got to do this. What's up, brother? How you doing, bro? Yeah, 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 yeah. All that bull crap, dude. Oh, I'm a tough guy. I always got to gotta maintain that tough guy, you know? Walking the pod, walking the pod, walking the pod, sitting there for a few weeks, whatever. Got to, you know, just got done crapping my pants for three days, you know, kicking heroin on, on, on a cold concrete floor in Durango or LBJ or wherever, you know, and it's like, yeah, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. And mean it. I'm done. Haven't seen my kid in two years. Got to get back to him. Got to do the right thing. And all of a sudden, I get the call. Trevor Chaka, D12, roll up. You guys ever get that call? Roll up. Yeah, it's time to roll up and get busy. Move out to the center pod. All of a sudden, man, kind of overreacting a little bit. Now you got that long window before you actually, before they buzz you out the final gate. You know, you got that long window, you got that six or eight hour window where you're out processing, doing your thing, going from cell to cell to cell, right? And then all of a sudden my head starts talking to me in this little voice, and it's my voice, and it's telling me things like, Heroin's the problem, bro. Shooting up's the problem, bro. Smoking off trays isn't that big of a deal. You know, doing some Percocets and snorting them, just don't smoke them or don't shoot them, it's not that big of a deal. Now, nah, actually, you know, the hard stuff is really the problem. Maybe we can just drink a couple beers, smoking weeds, not that big of a deal, dude. You're overreacting. Some of you guys are laughing because you know. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. That's why I said earlier, you're my brothers. I know, I know you. I know you. I don't met you, but I know you, right? Yeah. So you can see by the smiles, man. You know, and all of a sudden the gate buzzes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, bro, I need a ride to East Mesa. I go hustle the taxi cab. Now I'm in the taxi cab, knowing I got no money to pay this dude. Yeah, just pull over, just pull over, pull over right over here. Now I'm jumping the fence, running through the first yard. Got a dog chasing me. <laughs> Jumping the next fence, running, jumping to the next fence. I can hear the taxi cab peeling out, trying to find me. I go right up to the dope man's house. <laughs> hey, bro, you got any heroin for me? <laughs> you know, and here I am again, man, high, right after I get out of jail, you know, and the madness. You know, we talk about, talks about it in the book. The dude talks about, like, all of a sudden this great idea came into his head that, you know, there's not a cloud in the sky. There's no problem, man. Everything's going good. He's been sober for a little while. All of a sudden he gets this crazy crazy freaking idea in his head that if he has a, a couple shots of whiskey in his milk, if I put it in milk, it's cool, man. If I drink it in milk, not a big deal, you know? Like the insanity that goes on in be between our ears, you know? My sponsor always says, the dude that's trying to kill you is wearing your underwear right now, you know? Like it's this voice. The problem is here, you know? And if I were to walk out of this meeting tonight, right now, and throw my big book out the window as I was driving down the road, Seven plus years of recovery, a good connection with God, all of my relationships rebuilt, 
It wouldn't be but a quick few months before that madness would return into my mind and convince me it's okay to do it again. It will angle in on me one more time. I've proven that, you know? So anyways, man, I get sober, I'm sitting in jail, and uh, I'm sitting in jail, and I'm having a conversation with myself, and I'm like, I've got this, I'm having this hardcore realization, man, that, 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 like, like, I'm having this, I'm having a different experience for some reason internally, man, like, and some of you guys in here have had this recently, it may be just a different story, but, or it may look a little bit differently, but for me, I was sitting there, and I remember I was like, I need help. I'm like, dude, what I'm doing ain't working, you know? And I don't really believe in God. I'm not talking about currently, back then. I'm like, I don't really believe in God. But it might be worth saying a prayer. And I remember sitting there and I was like, God, if you're really out there and you really care, like, just, just help me, dude. And that was about as simple as that prayer was. It was no in-depth thing. It was no super, you know, and I remember sitting there and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I started having that experience where I was like, dude, <clears throat> I was like, dude, what you're doing, man? And I was 38. I'm like, what you're doing is not working, man. Everything, every plan that you come up with is not working. Every, every angle you try to take is not working. It always ends up in another detox facility or back in jail or back in the same exact crappy position, right? Or back in the Salvation Army or back in wherever or back on a prison yard or wherever, right? Like, like I'm just kind of checking myself in a weird way. I'm like, dude, it's not working what you're doing. It's not working, you know? Like, I need to do something different, but I don't know how to do that differently, you know? And uh, so anyways, I remember having some phone calls and, uh, and, and the suggestion was made to me, hey, if you can make it from jail to the solutions, which is the place that I went to, uh, if you can make it from here to this halfway house, and, that, and, the, and the person that said that to me was being dead serious because that was a long journey for a guy like me. From, from, from 4th Ave or from Durango down to a halfway house on 16th Street Indian School, a lot can go wrong for a dude like me real fast, you know? And so I remember making that journey, man, and I remember praying my whole, the whole way I got there. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get real general here and just say this, guys. What ended up happening, man, was for the first time in my life, I remember sitting with my sponsor and I remember saying, like, okay, what do you want me to do, dude? Like, you know, like, what do you want me to do, you know? And he was like, here's what we're going to do. Like, you're going to start paying your rent at the halfway house. You're going to start doing your chore. You're going to call me every single day. When I say every single day, I mean every single day. You're going to call me and check in. These are the pages you're going to read. Oh, by the way, this is the big book, right? And so, so we start going through the steps, man, and start doing work. And, uh, and he's like, you got to get a service commitment. And oh, by the way, he's like, uh, we, have a, uh, <laughs> we, we, have a, we have a meeting on Monday nights. And uh, it's a dinner. It's a traveling uh, dinner meeting. And like it, it goes all over the town, all over town, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, that's cool. That sounds good. Like I've got like 36 cents in my pocket. How am I going to afford dinner? <laughs> and uh, he's like, I don't care. You show up and you can drink water, you know? And uh, I was like, okay, cool. So anyways, we're going to meet at this meeting on a Monday night, man. And uh, so I, 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 I'm riding a, uh, a stolen mountain bike that I got from a dude, right? <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'm putting it on the bus, and, and I get on the bus, man, and I start riding across town, and they're meeting at, like, some place in Scottsdale, like, it's, like, Fuego de Chao or, like, some fancy pants stuff, man, that, like, dude like me don't know nothing about, you know? And I'm wearing these baggy, baggy halfway house donation clothes, you know? I got, like, halfway house donation pants on, a halfway house donation shirt on, you know, like a belt, and they're all baggy, and I'm riding a stolen mountain bike, and dude's like, hey, you need to come to this meeting, and I'm showing up to, like, a really nice part of Scottsdale with, like, a crappy backpack on my back and a big book, and I'm like, you know, like, like, okay, dude, like, I'm here, and he's like, cool, I'm glad you made it, you know? I'm, I'm super, I'm super happy you made it, man, and, uh, and, and, you know, we would sit down, and, and he would buy me a little something, you know, he'd buy me some food, you know, man, because I made it out there, and, uh, and then when we were done, man, it was like, he would sit there, and he would say, okay, throw your bike in the back of the truck, and I'll give you a ride home, you know? And for some of you guys, that won't fully resonate, but when I, when I think about that, man, I get emotional, um, and here's why. 
when, I, when my life started changing when I started saying the word okay, right? My, my sponsor, he's like an old Vietnam vet. He looks like Kenny Rogers. He's got this weird, like, perfect, perfect hair, you know? Like 70 something years old, you know? And, uh, and, and, and he's looking at me and he's saying, yeah, you need to be at Fuego de Chao at 6 p.m. on a Monday night. And, 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 and my head's going like this and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, F you, Kenny Rogers, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but what comes out of my mouth is, okay, you know? And, 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 and I'm on my bike and I'm riding over there, right? Hey, you need to be over at the Tuesday Man Stag at 8 p.m. on this night, just figure out how to get there. F you, Kenny Rogers, <laughs> you know? And, 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 and what comes out of my mouth is, okay, hey, you need to read these pages in the big book. Hey, you need to do this service commitment. Hey, why didn't you show up to your service commitment? Hey, you need to be honest, Trevor. Hey, you need to, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to do this. Okay, Kenny Rogers, you know, like, I started showing up and doing things, man, and when I was talking about getting emotional, it was like, he would tell me at the end of it, hey, throw your bike in the back of the truck, I'll give you a ride home. And it was his way of seeing if I was actually willing to do what he was laying down in front of me. Like, hey, dude, I'm gonna help you out, but this isn't gonna be a free ride. I'm not gonna coddle you, and I'm not gonna disrespect you or be mean to you, but I'm gonna ask you some, to do some stuff that's uncomfortable and awkward. And it's not gonna feel good because you're in your first 30, 60, 90 days of sobriety, but you need to shut your lips and do what I'm telling you to do if you wanna start walking on the other side of the real life. Because where you're at now is a result of your decision making, right? And where you wanna go is not, is, is, is you're not gonna get there based on your decision making process of your history, trust me. And when that dude would ask me to do something, okay, Kenny Rogers. I would, man. And I started doing that, you know? And we started going through the steps and started breaking it down for me. Read these pages, do this. Oh, this is what a real alcoholic is? Oh, I, I have the phenomenon of craving and I suffer from the mental obsession and then I have the spiritual malady and I started thinking, oh yeah, man, like, that's me, dude, you know? And, and then we started talking about developing a relationship with God. And I started getting on my knees and praying. And I told you guys earlier, my prayers were simple, man. It wasn't some big, long-winded prayer because I didn't know how to pray like that. Man, I got up in the morning and I started reluctantly hitting my knees and I would just say, God, help me today. Just please, man, I'm getting the chills thinking about it. I was like, God, just please help me today. Like, man, I don't know what direction I'm about ready to go. And I could just feel this monster in my head, man, saying, bro, this is, this is, dude, this is all bull crap, dude. Like, you're overreacting, man. You've got no reason to be here. You're healthy again. you got 17 days sober, dude. You're good to go, man. Like, you're good, bro. You know? The crap's out of your system, man. You're good, bro. Go get a job. Go, go get a car. Get back with your life, you know? And I'm having this war inside my head, man, and it's telling me all these things. Leave, leave the halfway house. Screw this, they're asking me to do this. And I got this voice going on in my head, man, and, and what I would do, man, was I'd just get up in the morning and I'd say, please, God, like, save me, man. Just please, man, like, I don't want to go back to that. Like, I don't want to go back to that lifestyle, you know? And the coolest, 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 coolest stuff started happening. Got that first 30-day chip, made it. Woke up one morning, and I was like, oh my God, the, mon the monkey's not on my back. Like, I haven't, it's 2 p.m., man, and I haven't thought about getting loaded, you know? Oh my God, it's Thursday, and I didn't, I didn't think about getting loaded on Wednesday. I went a whole day without thinking about getting loaded, you know? And, and I'd show up, man, and I'd clean the bathroom in the halfway house, man, and I'd get a strike for spitting on the grass at the halfway house, and I'd be in there doing dishes, man, and they would say, that's the God honest truth, man, like, you, you know where you're gonna meet God? You're gonna meet God in service work, man. And I would be sitting there doing the dishes, man, and it would be just, just, just bringing all that emotion. I'd be doing the dishes. I was like, yeah, man, like I'm meeting God like right here, you know, like doing this, you know? And so anyways, all this cool stuff started happening, man, and, and are we that far into it? Okay, so anyways. Six months down the road, man. <clears throat> is that clock right, right? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Six months down the road, man. I'm sitting there, and uh, I go to court, man, and uh, I get uh, I get subpoenaed to court uh, to have my rights severed from my kids. I hadn't seen them in quite some time, and uh, I go into go into court, and I'm 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 on a mission, man. I'm gonna go in there. I'm gonna tell the judge this is what's going on, and uh, I'm I'm sober, dude, and I'm doing the right thing, you know. And uh, and the judge says, charge you know. You're gonna get your uh, right, we're gonna sever your rights. I said, no, Your Your Honor, I, I want my son. 
I want him. You know, I want to see him. I want to, I want to spend some time with him. You know, and and, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, the judge is like, he's like, he's like, he's like, oh yeah. And I said, yeah, I've been sober for six months. And, and my ex is, is is on the other side of the courtroom, and she's like, she's sitting there, and she goes, uh, she yells, she yells across the room. She's like, he always says he's sober. You know, <laughs> you know. And she's like, all right. She's like, she's like, he, the, the judge is like, okay, well, we're we're gonna we're gonna send him to uh, we're gonna send him to task. We'll do a hair follicle test. Two weeks later, I was back in there, and the judge looks down there, fixes his glasses, and looks down at the little paper, and he goes, "Well, Mrs. Gardner, he's telling the truth. He's sober." <laughs> Six, you know, they plucked the hair out of my chest. I was like, "Yeah, what's up now?" You know, and and I uh, started going through this process, man, where I had like supervised visitation, saw my kid for the first time in, in a really, really long time, and I had this weird counselor that would follow me around, you know, and, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that, you know, and take little notes, you know, and then all of a sudden, I was like. Yeah, cool, man. Now I got now now I can see my kid on Friday for like four hours, you know, and I went to take him to the park and hang out and do things, you know, and then and then all of a sudden it was like, yeah, he's doing good, you know, and then all of a sudden the judge is like, hey, you know, check it out. You can have it overnight, Friday night. You can have it overnight, you know, and and, and I'm going through, man, and I'm and I'm and I'm sitting there and I'm making amends, and I remember uh, his grandfather, man, she, he absolutely absolutely couldn't stand me, you know, because I'm like the dude that gets totally weird when I'm loaded, man. Like like. I chase people around and kick doors down and do really stupid and, and weird stuff and and, uh, and, and, and and his daughter particularly, dude, not a nice dude, an ugly dude, you know, and, and especially when I'm loaded, man, not getting my way. I'm a super, super selfish guy. And uh, and I remember him, him hating me and I remember him being on my men's list, you know, and uh, and I remember, uh, I remember my sponsor saying, you need to go make amends to him. And I'm like, oh man, like this dude's huge, bro. Like I don't want to go make amends to him. I'm sober, man. Like I don't want to go make amends to this guy, you know? And uh, I remember, Going up to him one day, and I remember, uh, I remember going to his house. I was, my son was staying at his house, and I remember going there, and um, and uh, I remember uh, I was taught, you know, early on, man, that you need to gain consent because if somebody doesn't want to hear your story, man, you need to get on down the road, you know, and and uh, so basically, you need to gain their consent, or you need to ask their permission. And I asked him, I was like, "Hey, Gary, I go, I got an amends that I'd like to make to you. It's really important to me, and and uh, I just want to know if you're open to hearing it, and uh, if you want it, if you're not open to hearing it." Uh, via a conversation, then uh, I'll write you a letter, or give you a phone call, you know, and he said, no, come on in. I was like, oh, man, you know, <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. And uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to make it quick, guys. But so, so, so I'm sitting there and uh, I'm sitting on the couch and this dude's like this, he's, you know, he's like this monster, dude. He's like six foot eight, like 290 pounds, you know, just a big dude, you know. And, and, and so I'm sitting there with him and, and, and his wife. And uh, I lay it out for him, and I and I tell him, you know, man, how selfish I had been, and how dishonest I had been, and and, and, and how horrible I feel about uh, uh, what I put their family through, and I went into some specific things, and wasn't trying to necessarily re re rehash the details, the deep ugly details, but uh, I was certainly there to uh, to make an honest and willing effort, man, to to straighten some things out with them, and uh, and he stopped and he looked at me, and, and his eyes watered up, and he said, you know, Trevor, he said. Uh, he said, when I was 13, man, he said, uh, and I didn't know this. He said, uh, when I was 13, he said, my dad was a raging, raging alcoholic, fierce alcoholic. And uh, he said, uh, one day his dad pulls up, they're living like in a, in a, in a trailer thing. He was driving this old like brown Lincoln or something, I think he said, big, one of them little big 70s cars, you know. Pulls up, opens a trunk up on the back, comes in, grabs his bags, grabs the bags full of stuff, of his stuff, throws them into the trunk of the car, closes in the trunk of the car, and then peels out, takes off, and he's gone, you know? And, and, and his dad had done this before. Fierce alcoholic, grabs his stuff, takes off, he's gone for a week or two. Well, he said, uh, and he's sitting there, man, and, he, and, he, and I'm in the middle of this amends with this dude, and, he, and he, he's, his eyes are just filled you know, and he said, I was 13, 14, whatever. And he said, uh, one month went by, two months went by, three months went by. He said, my 14th birthday was coming. And he said, I had this fantasy in my head that my father was gonna come back on my 14th birthday. He had never taken me fishing. And I had this fantasy that my father was gonna drive back up and surprise me on my 14th birthday take me fishing. So he'd sit there and he would stare out the window. And his 14th birthday went by and his dad never showed up. His 15th birthday went by. Same thing. Didn't show up. 16th birthday went by. 
was for sure his dad was going to show up on his 16th birthday. Never saw his dad again. Always wanted his dad to take him fishing. And he said, Trevor, every time you come in and out of Dylan's life, and you disappear on your drug runs and your boozing expeditions and back in jail, doing what you're doing, whatever, whatever you want, I sit there and have to relive that. And I see you doing to, your, to my grandson exactly what my father did to me. And he said, I think it's admirable that, you, admirable that you're actually here, though. I think you got a chance at being a decent dude. The fact that you're sitting here in front of me and apologizing to me. He said, yeah, this I said, and I finished up. I said, I want to know what I can do to make it right, Gary. He said, you want to do it? He said, take your son fishing. <laughs> so, of course, what do I do, man? I got him at Walmart, bro, and I got him the Batman fishing rod, you know? And I got, it, I got the little tackle box, and I'm like, I don't want to go to jail, son. Let's go get a fishing license, you know? So we got a fishing license, you know? And, uh, you know, and, uh, and there's, I'm running out of time, dudes. So I just want to tell you guys, you know, I, I went too long in the early part of my story, man, and I'm so sorry, but, but dude, like, like, it's so cool right now. Like, like, the dad that I hadn't seen for almost 10 years, man, like, I got a bitchin' ass, a awesome relationship with him, you know? Sorry, guys. I got an awesome relationship with him, you know? Like, he just took off to Italy. Here's a crazy story, right? Real quick, he just took off to Italy. They're going overseas. He's retired. He worked hard his whole life. Hadn't seen him in 10 years. Made amends to him. Got that relationship back. On Friday, before they took off, he came over to the house. He said, all right, here you go. Here's the key to my truck. Here's the key to the house. Here's the key to the, the safety deposit box. Everything that I own, everything that our family owns is in that safety deposit box. If anything happens to me and, and, your, and your mom, he goes, here, this is, everything's in there. You don't need to, just, here it is. Like, he hands that stuff to me, like, right? Like, the dude trusts me 100%. He knows I'm going to show up today. My, I got married in sobriety, man. I started a business in sobriety, dude. Like, I was a blown out junkie. I'm a licensed, bonded, and insured uh, general contractor now, remodeling contractor. I own my own company. I own my own truck. Like, so many cool things have happened as a result of doing the work, developing a relationship with God, saying okay, and doing awkward things. If I'm going to leave you guys with anything, and I'm going to tell you this from my raw experience, and I'm going to shut up after this. If I can leave you guys with anything, the most important decision that you're going to make with where you're sitting right now is the day that you walk out of this facility or the day you hit the gate and you're leaving prison or the day you roll up and leave jail. Do not leave here thinking you have a plan in order that's going to work that you devised. I'm telling you, man, as soon as, as, soon as you graduate this facility, you need to be on the horn with your sponsor saying, dude, come get me. Or dude, what meeting do I need to meet you at? Like, don't let any gap of time transition you from this, this, this awesome program and this awesome facility to going out there and thinking you're going to do things your way for a while if you're a real alcoholic or a real drug addict because it will fail miserably on you. And I'm speaking from experience, and I'm speaking from hearing other dudes' experiences over and over and over again. Went through the six-month process over at the Sally, graduated, got my certificate, went home for a week, got loaded. Didn't take any action when I left here. Didn't get into service work when I left here. Didn't start going to meetings when I left here. Didn't call my sponsor when I left here. Got loaded. You know what I mean? And I don't want to see that happen to you guys. The only reason I'm standing here tonight is because when Jay or anybody else asked me on a Monday night to come and share and I can make it work inside that schedule, I'm here doing the work. And I'm not special, bro. Trust me. You know? I love you guys. Thank you for letting me talk. Yeah.